Shall we start or yes. wait for some time? We can yes, start. Yes, we can. So just I'm playing <coughs> one uh, mantra. Okay. So, thank you so much. And uh, the meaning of this song, this mantra, is from the unreal lead me to the real, from darkness lead me to light, from death led me to immortality. Namaskar, I Randhir Kumar Gautam on behalf of School of Humanities and Social Science of Raffles University, I welcome everyone. I also welcome you on behalf of Swadhyay Sahchakra, Circle for Creative Co-Learning, Vishwanidhan Center for Creativity and Blossoming, Uddu Cheri, Rage Global Foundation in USA, Jimmy, I wanted to make it some international webinar. Uh, I think uh, kindly mute yourself. I think someone. Yes. Yeah, I think Haji is on. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. It's my honor to have the distinguished speaker, Professor yes, Anand Kumar Giri, sir, professor at Madras Institute of Developing Studies. I welcome. Our Chief Patron, Honorable Justice Dr. Meena V. Bombar, former Ch Chief Justice of Rajasthan High Court, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Raffles University, Dr. Divakar Goli, sir, Professor Ajit Kumar Pandey, sir, Professor of Sociology, Banaras Hindu University, Dr. B.T. Pius, sir, Head of the Department of Philosophy. Awesome University, Salcha, and all the respected participants. First of all, greetings on Krishnamurti's 126th birth anniversary. Let me try to give a brief context of today's webinar. You know, Jadu Sri Krishnamurti lived from 1895 to 1986 and is regarded as one of the greatest philosophical and spiritual figures of all time. Understanding his philosophy, understanding his teaching is really a tremendous significance. Although his philosophy is something uncommon. Simplicity and elegance mark his work and writing, but one needs to put in deep insights to understand his concepts because they are simply the very simplicity of Krishnamurti's teaching confuses our sophisticated minds. You know, during his childhood, he came in contact with philosophical society, any recent and lead better who educated him, believing him to be a figure, a spiritual leader. However, the scope of Sri Krishnamurti's teaching is contained in the statement he made in 1929, where he said, truth is a pathless land. Later he broke away 
from Theosophical Society and travels all over the world as an independent thinker and writer on fundamental human issues. The beauty of Sri Krishnamurti teaching is that he did not offer a school. He did not offer a cult of any sort. According to him, these things make our mind fragmented and we live our life in fragmented. And for him, a mind that is fragmented shall never be aware of fully consciousness. I find a kind of existentialist philosophical attitudes like John Paul Sartre in him. Krishnamurti's teaching empowered individual. He conceived that meaningful changes in society can only happen through radical transformation of individual consciousness. He emphasized on total awareness and continuous awareness that will lead to living a non-habitual life and no amount of disi discipline, no method will do it. And once again, discipline is not freedom from the known. That is why Krishnamurti does not trust ideals. He does not trust ideologies. His purpose was to set humankind unconditionally free from destructive limitations <clears throat> of conditioned mind. According to Krishnamurti, when one becomes aware of one's conditioning, one understands the entire consciousness. Consciousness in consciousness is uh, the total field in which thoughts, functions, and relationships exist. Liberation of being is one of the crucial insights of his thinking. The liberating process must begin with the choiceless awareness. And he said freedom is found in the choiceless awareness in our everyday existence and everyday life activity. Awareness of the self is an essentially for a free mind from conditioning, right? So Krishmurti teaching is a liberating philosophy and he has philosophy only in the sense of love of truth. It shows the misery of modernism, people's deep down psychological primitivism, psychological primitiveness, their moral distress. So therefore, Krishmurti teaching is very significant. And Krishmurti holds the relevance in the modern understanding of mind and consciousness. And he gave a new insights into human mind. This is very important to unmask what reality is from what it perceives and conceives. I think his thought has critical engagement, which has also paved a way of democratic process when we see his ideas on education. So his thought also paved a way of creativity and transformation. With this brief context, now I would like to invite Professor Anand Giri to give more thoughts and more insights on the very topic of today's webinar. That is, thought are not working alone. Critics, creativity, and transformation. Sir, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, dear Gandhi. Thank you all, dear friends, co-present with uh, Krishnamurti, Jiddu Krishnamurti, on his immortal birthday, and we hope Krishnamurti is also with us and being with us. And uh, on this day with uh, Krishnamurti, I thought we can meditate and think together with Krishnamurti. Uh, and uh, and this this theme: thoughts are not working alone. Critique, creativity, and transformations. 
And I also have added a few things as an invitation for our co-presence to take these uh, themes further, deeper, and, uh, and, and wider. And it is called Thoughts Are Not Working Alone, Critic, Creativity, and Transformation Towards a New Upanishad of Life. And an ecology of folk. Let me at this juncture share this screen. There is some noise coming, so I request all friends to kindly mute themselves. So, dear friends, creativity and transformation. How do we engage with thought? For example, with Krishnamurti himself, with a spirit of critique and creativity. One of my earliest experience of Krishnamurti was many years ago, almost 40 years ago, when I listened to him through a lecture, and it was a video recorded lecture, and where he is saying, dear friends, he is sharing this with all friends co-present in that moment of conversation. He is saying that I am here with you but I have not already thought about what I am going to tell you. So by this, Krishnamurti challenged all presents to come to the present of thinking. And he said that he didn't want to present something which already he had thought. He thought that presenting already thought thinking is not doing justice to the creativity of thinking, to the creativity of the moment. So remembering that experience with Krishnamurti, I thought one of the important ways of thinking from Krishnamurti with Krishnamurti is that how do we think with the pregnant present and not being conditioned but not being conditioned or unconditioned thinking or pathways of unconditional and thinking. Also, how do we engage with varieties of conditions of life and society? So how do we walk and meditate with Krishnamurti, but also walk and meditate with society? as students of society, which some of us are. How do we make a dialogue? For example, when Krishnamurti talks about liberation, how do we make a dialogue between Krishnamurti and Habermas, for example? Habermas is a book called Knowledge and Human Interest, where he's talking about a kind of liberatory knowledge. And in dialogue with that, I have also composed a book called Knowledge and Human Liberation. Therefore, yes, we cultivate unconditional thinking. But that unconditional thinking also happens in the context of varieties of conditions. And we have to engage with both conditions of thinking and only with critical and creative engagement, we can move with varieties of conditions towards varieties of degrees of unconditional thinking and practice. Here we can think about Fred Dalmayer, who is also a deep creative and critical thinker of our times, who is becoming 92 or 93 very quickly but his mode of being with the world is as creative as Krishnamurti. And I say this with all humility, 
and del maya many years ago almost 40 years ago while reflecting on the challenge of theorizing he said that when we theorize there is a system a systematic way of theorizing that is we we say that this is the marxist system there is some uh, sound happening dear friend please mute yourself so we say that this is marxist system and we are thinking according to that system or there is liberalism for example ramdhir mentioned that how uh, krishnamurti didn't build any system similarly in indian sociology this thought is attributed to professor andre bete if you read the book in honor of professor andre bete co-edited by ramachandra guha and jonathan perry so Ram ramachandra guha makes this comment that andre bete didn't build any system very interesting therefore from that point of view dear friends let us think of krishnamurti and andre bete for example as two people for example who have not built systems similarly it is said that gandhi has not built any system so there are very interesting challenges to how do we learn with thinkers and creators of ideas like krishnamurti who didn't build system gandhi also didn't build any system but at the same time has many many important ideas including heuristic ideas that are very important for students of sociology and philosophy and of course andre bete you know his work in sociology which is so significant but he didn't build any system for example that can be attributed so coming back to this whole challenge of thinking and theorizing how do we think and theorize not constrained by systems but at the same time when we theorize and think we cannot live under an illusion that there are no constraints there are constraints there are conditions there are habits now how do we acknowledge habits that are with us the great sociologist pierre bourdieu talks about habitus but these habitus in burdo are mainly mechanical but with krishna burti can we bring life to the habitus in the sense that these are our habits of body habits of mind how do we become aware of the habits and then these habits becoming aware of these habits these habits become more and more freer we can become bring, bring a life of spirit to the habits and of course we can remember here the work of robert bella in 1985 he and his co writers they gifted us a book called habits of the heart so how do we think in such a way that it um, it corresponds to new modality of habits of the mind habits of the heart to and this is my uh, you know initial you know very brief dialogue with krishna bhakti and later on i would invite us to be with this challenge in multiple ways where we may not immediately refer to the works of krishna bhakti but the challenge would be to cross thinking um, you know to thinking together for example how do we think with krishna murthy with sri aurobind with j n mohanty whose work is a great uh, philosopher and thinker a very creative phenomenologist who is talking about a new phenomenology later on i would discuss the idea of a new archaeology you know michael fuko talked about archaeology of knowledge and i am building on that i am exploring a new archaeology of life a new phenomenology a new archaeology of life and a new upanishad of life and if one of the methodology of krishnamurti if you look at his video you will find 
the whole intimacy of conversation. Though without naming it, Krishna Bhakti embodied that Upanishadic way of being together. We sit together and we speak with each other, not to not just to to each other. There is a difference between speaking to and speaking with. As the great philosopher R. Sundara Raj, he makes a distinction between knowledge of and knowledge with. So when we speak together, when we are with each other, when we are learning together, it constitutes the possibility, the reality and possibility of learning as an Upanishad. And this Upanishad is not only Upanishad of society, but an Upanishad of life. There is a life is far bigger than society. And we should not forget that. So with this, I begin with two points. It is called alphabets of creation. One is A for Aleph, Aum, Alam, B for beginning, C for creation, A is also for annihilation, B banning and bigotry, C cunning and cruelty. How do we work with Aleph and annihilation together in the alphabet of creation? towards the new tapasya of transformation. And the second one is, welcome Dr. Goli. Dr. Goli has just joined. The second, the second one is Apostle of Fear. Because one of the great invitation of Krishnamurti is freedom from fear. And for example, freedom from the known is also freedom from the fear of the unknown and also listening. So the whole practice of knowledge and thinking requires a great deal of listening. And this listening is multiple, listening to each other, of course, a new Upanishad of listening, but listening also to unheard voices as Harsh Manda, you know, he has a book called Unheard Voices. And which are these unheard voices? And he's talking about the widows who are killed and murdered by the killing mob during the anti sikh riots in 1984. And today also, at this moment, we are living in a moment where people who are crying for oxygen cylinder they cannot express that crime. And some government want to penalize them that why you are expressing your cry that you need a cylinder. What kind of barbaric society we are living today. It is in that context to be able to listen to on hard voice, listen to cries, listen to many voices is a very important challenge for thinking. And the poem goes like this. Apostasy, apostle of fear. Where are apostles of fear? Marching in the name of Ramarajya, kingdom of God, kingdom of Rama. Banishing Sita and killing Sambuka on the way Sacrificing innocence as lambs. Where are your tears? Where are our ears? So when we think, can we think with our ears and tears? Thinking is not an isolated activity. Thoughts are not working alone. So moving further, I we can invite Sri Aurobindo here, who is using this press, press slightly differently. In his Sabitri, Sri Aurobindo writes, even new great thoughts are here that work alone. 
and when sri aurobindo said new great thoughts are here new thoughts like when krishna murti planted his thoughts he had to work alone a little bit and then people join but even when people join you the challenge of working alone is not bereft from us as tagore song jadi tor dak jadi tor dak sune ke uno ase tabe ekla chole re ekla chole so our mortal life ride on the spirit's wings our finite thoughts commute with the infinite so another meaning of thoughts are not working alone is to realize that our finite thoughts each of our thought is finite but they are communing with the infinite we are thoughts leaned on a vision beyond thought again this is very important thoughts which are thoughts are they limited to our sense perception are they limited to only the frames that are we that are we are used to and this is the challenge that krishna murti was faced at. therefore sri aurobindo is saying thoughts they take us to also beyond thought and save the world from the unthinkable this is also very important how do we think the unthought and i think this is also an invitation from krishna murti and let on when i invite martin heidegger we can feel that how this is also a crucial challenge how do we think the unthought but before that we can quickly invite here jn mohanty jn mohanty is a very deep philosopher a very creative student of many including gandhi sri aurobindo and of course um, uh, you know edmond husserl the great phenomenological thinker and in his own way martin heidegger now mohanty is saying in his book between two worlds east and west an autobiography and in a way krishnamurti's world is also between many worlds you know he was born in india and he traveled all across he lived in california and he spoke with people from many traditions and mohanty says thinking cannot simply put together ideas as though they are slabs of stone thinking has to enter into them loosen their rigidity transform them into the fluidity of its own movement and refashion a new form out of that fluid like the way a jeweler transforms an ornament into a new one so what a poetic way and what an invitation that when we are thinking something let us give life to it and here i am remembering a very beautiful short story written by the great sociologist m n srinivas dear friends many of you you may not have realized that srinivas also was a very very deep story writer and and speaking about that a great story writer not only great story writer a great story teller professor manoj das born in odisha living in pondicherry but touching millions of people all over the world including in rajasthan i remember in his book my little india so he writes uh, which in odia is called antaranga bharata he writes how while traveling to to jaipur from delhi there is ticket in his pocket but he didn't find his ticket you know so that is how you know but coming back to stories you know that uh, different stories of life that uh, mn srinivas in this uh, story he is writing about an image maker an idol maker an idol is creating you know a, an idol out of clay but how when he gives life to the idol the idol becomes alive 
and one of the deeply heart touching story of manoj babu manoj da is the story of a little girl lakshmi lakshmi ra abhisara lakshmi's adventure when lakshmi is entering into the temple lakshmi is speaking with the divine and he sees a lot of banana there and he is concerned that if god eats all the banana then he would fall ill and the the uh, the this story ends very tragically and i do not have time to discuss the whole story but to come back to this point as shrinivas describes the process of building an idol out of clay and it becomes alive as manoj babu in this story lakshmi ra avisar adventure of lakshmi lakshmi speaks with the divine similarly dear friends when we are thinking how do we give life to our thinking and and we have some sisters <laughs> in our discussion here and they can appreciate the beauty of jewelry and then and we also make our thinking beautiful as beautiful like a like an ornament like a thread that we are wearing moving on jain mahanti also his own experience is very interesting he is saying but uh, uh but a merely scholarly scientific philosophy had never captured my mind the old interest of mine the old the old interest of my youth gandhi and sri aurobindo we are not uh, totally gone like can't i continue to believe that philosophy had to be gone in spite of its scientific character a theory of belt wise and husserl's idea that the philosopher had to be a functionary of human kind so we can bring this to krishnamurti also that how whether we are sociologists or philosopher how do we belong to the world later on mohanty talks about world loyalty our loyalty is to the world and we become functionary of human kind in the spirit of gandhi we become servant of humanity and mohanty continues and uh, and and he continues that he says that i do not believe in god but that does not mean that i didn't believe in spirituality and he says that the whole idea of spirituality is to appreciate the sacredness of humanity again i think this is a thing that touches the spirit of krishna murti sacredness of life sacredness of nature and the moral responsibility to preserve life nature and human kind and that is the name what an white head another great philosopher known for his book adventure of ideas talks about world loyalty so moving on uh mohanty here says and we have some philosopher friends here i'm very grateful to dr payas and dr saji bhargis two of my very dear philosophical friends and they can help us to take this ideas forward as i'm grateful to professor ajit pande the great sociologist with philosophical interest mohanty talks about a new phenomenology and he is saying singularly free from hegel's absolutism and he is talking about edmund husserl with a sense for the openness of the march of the human spirit unfortunately still cut off in the eurocentrism of hegel husserl edmund husserl showed the way so what he is saying that with husserl at least this absolute spirit didn't become closed it was open but he says that even with edmund husserl it was eurocentric and another theme that we will touch in our conversation is the challenge of thinking beyond eurocentrism and that is where thinking becomes a conversation conversation coming from our multiple groups if we are born in europe we we begin with europe if we are born in odisha as some of us are we begin with the way of thinking with odisha india and the world 
So that kind of thinking as conversation with our roots, but beyond the narrow-minded closure of our roots, what I call as beyond ethnocentrism and Eurocentrism. And Mahanti here talks about a new phenomenology and building on Hegel and Husserl and also bringing our African Indian experiences together. And to think with Krishnamurti today, that if we would have to think unconditionally and how that unconditional thought acknowledges the multiple conditions of our thinking, multiple roots, European, African, Latin American, Odisha, our tribal roots, and at the same time, with those conditions, how do we move from varieties of what I would like to call as creative unconditional. So moving on, then here we can also invite Swami Vivekananda quite quickly, where he is challenging us to realize that the seed must be a living seed. Thinking must be again a living seed. It is not just what uh, uh, Swami Vivekananda calls as text torturing. What a beautiful phrase. <laughs> and I think all of us with our passion for discussion and analytical, you know, implications, we must remember this, this challenging thought from Swami Vivekananda that are we engaged in text torturing and are we torturing each other in the name of thought, thinking and, uh, and thinker. And as you can realize that many of our classes in sociological thought might be an exercise in text torturing. But this is not our destiny. We can make it more livable by bringing it, uh, bringing life to thinking. And then we go on. And here again, I discuss how thinking is a living process, which I have already uh, you know, shared a bit. And that living process has a dynamic. And here I'm writing. Many a time our thinking is a reproduction of the habitual. But even habits of thinking have some sparks of, uh, have some sparks of uh, uh, self-criticism and aspiration for renewal and transformation within and across them. And it is in this context to think we would have to dwell our thinking. We would have to live with our thinking, dwelling. How do we dwell our thinking? We just do not live in our houses. We also live in our thinking. And Heidegger is saying we need to dwell in our thinking differently. And we need to... Uh, and our thinking, and in this process, we would have to access lost and forgotten recesses of thought and creating differently pathways of thinking. Because many thoughts we have lost, how do we recover? And later on, I have a uh, quotation from a great scholar um, from uh, of uh, Alama. Iqbal, uh, you know, Professor Javid, and, and I would come to Iqbal a little later, but at this juncture, let me bring Iqbal here, and who is known for this beautiful song, Sare Jahan Se Acha, Hindu Sita Hamara. But what is Hindu Sita Hamara? Is it only the Hindustan of the present? Even when there was no Hindu Sita Hamara, the name Hindustan, we got it. Maybe when our Muslim brothers and sisters came 700, 800 years ago, before that, or along with that, we have the name Arya Bhacha, but also Bharata Bhacha. So the point is to think India, for example, how do we move beyond the temptations of the prison of the present, like the idea of India, 
the idea of india with sunil kilani and others even those people who are talking about idea of india today even political discourse our time span is very limited so thinking with india then we would have to recover from the recesses of thinking from a very great a kind of a well of our uh, you know reality which we do not see and that is where it's a new archaeology and 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 Iqbal talks about detemporalizing thinking, and this is how Professor Javid interprets Iqbal. And later on, I would like to link it to a new way of interpretation and realization, which I call as multi-temporal, a new kind of hermeneutics, which is multi-temporal hermeneutics. Thinking here is both self-attuning as well as relational meditative as well as socially engaging and this is a very key challenge because thinking has a dimension which resonates with the challenge of krishnamurti that is posing us unconditional thinking requires solitude what i call as meditative solitude but that meditative solitude also is not away from links with society so how do we bring meditative solitude and societal sociality, critical sociality together. So moving on, so here social thought becomes conversation. And social thought becomes conversation in the sense that thinking from is conversational. Sociology, for example, as a part of social thought, it becomes conversational. It learns together with philosophy and literature. And, and that sociology becomes a transdisciplinary discipline. Then we have uh, this kind of a sociology, for example which is applicable to all social sciences. And again, this is the spirit from Krishnamurti also. A kind of awareness about limits of naive scientism. We may remember here, science is important, but science is also evolving. Now, Krishnamurti was in dialogue with another great physicist, David Bond. Together, they have a very interesting conversation. So let us bring that conversation to thinking about science and social science. And here science is not just positivism. Here, Jürgen Habermann and our dear friend, <laughs> uh, B.T. Pius is a scholar, as a creative scholar of Habermas and he's taking Habermas into many directions. <laughs> now Habermas is a thought, today we need a new philosophy of science, which is not scientistic. Similarly, today we need a sociology where it is not scientific in that way, but at the same time, it learns with science. It does not, it does not accept all biases and prejudices. For example, those who think that uh, if you take the holy water Ganga, Ganga Jal, <laughs> then the virus cannot enter. Now, what kind of things it is? And today in Times of India, I think both the Hindu and Times of India, and this is a lesson that was reiterated during the onset of the pandemic, that let us not play with science. And this is a challenge that, uh, you know, candidate Biden, Joe Biden, when he was arguing with President Trump then, he also said, and this is a challenge, that uh, Greta Thornburg, you know, who in his, uh, you know, in his conversation with then President Donald Trump said that let us not create our own climate fiction. And so therefore, let us not play with science in this sense, but at the same time, let us create a new way of being with science, including on certain things, you know. And it is in this context that social scientists, sociologists, for example, Jürgen Habermas, Robert Bella, 
Jigmund Bauman, Alan Turen, Pete Stridham, Andre Bete, T.N. Madan, Bina Das, and our dear friend John Clemmer, among many others. With them, sociology is becoming a critical and creative fellow traveler of a fuller understanding of our complex interconnected world and its transformations. With sociology such as Zygmunt Bauman, sociology is becoming a field of conversation with people, and this is creating a new sociological hermeneutic. And to make sense of this new sociological hermeneutic, we need to talk about hermeneutics a little bit. For example, hermeneutics as interpretation of text but it is not just interpretation of text, it is also interpretation of life. And that interpretation has also a critical dimension. As I discuss it, uh, you know, vis a vis in my next slide, a critical hermeneutic with Foucault, Michael Foucault, where he's saying that the whole idea of hermeneutics is to go beyond models of individualization given by state. Today, who we are, we are Indians. But what is our identity as an India? Now, it is only what the state wants us to do. But it is in that state model, you know, when our brothers and sisters in, in Bangladesh, they are going to go down water after 20 years. Then soon do we do anything about it with the virus that is happening, you know, that how do we create a global identity, how do we realize that Vasudeva Kutumbaka? Fred Dalmayer, also in his dialogue with Hans George Gadamer, the great initiator of hermeneutics in our recent times. And Dalmayer is reading Gadamer in such a way. He's saying that when Gadamer is saying that, yes, we begin with our life world, it has some prejudices, some biases. We begin with that. But that does not mean that we become totally uncritical about it. And my dear friend Hans Herbert Kogler, he is bringing Gadamer and Foucault together and bringing a very interesting part of critical hermeneutics. I visited uh, you know, uh, Herbert some years ago in 2017. I stayed with his beautiful home in, in Florida. And so it is a, it's a blessing for me to have the opportunity to learn with people like Hans Herbert Kochler, who is really cultivating seeds of a critical hermeneutic. And we can, and that is also in the spirit of Krishnamurti, because the whole idea of the critic, how do we cultivate that critic, creativity, and transformation together? So coming back to hermeneutics, I also want to quickly bring the idea of how do we interpret while moving? For example, moving from one culture to another. This is the idea of diatopial hermeneutics spoken by uh, Raimunda Panika. Again, another great Krishnamurti-like figure. And Panika, you might know that he was born into a, a, a Brahmin, uh, you know, I think, yes, I think a Brahmin, uh, a Spanish father and a Brahmin mother from Kerala. And his life has been moving across. For example, he came to Banaras and studied the Vedas. <laughs> Professor Pandey would be happy to know. And then he wrote a book called the Mantra Manjari, the Vedic experience, the Mantra Manjari. When we read Panika, we feel the challenge. That when Panikar is writing about the Vedas, what is its implication for sociology? Two, one implication is border crossing, you know, that how a Catholic priest studied the Vedic. And studying the Vedic in a way, not just as a closed system, but as an open way, as, the, as, a, as, as a possible experience for human. Therefore, hermeneutics is not closed, it is moving. This moving is not only between two cultures, for example, Catholicism and the Hindu tradition, or Islam and Christianity. It is across multiple traditions. And this I call it multi-topial We move across multiple traditions. Because though physically we have two feet, but spiritually and mentally we have million feet. 
But when we move across, we are not only moving across space, we are also moving across time. And that's for we are living in the present, but we are not prisoners of the present. Therefore, learning with our ancestors, our fathers and mothers, because Buddha lived 5,500 years ago, is Buddha less wise compared to the contemporary philosophy? Ashoka, for example, and I am saying this with respect. I hope I will not be put into difficulty. Ashoka lived many years ago. Does it mean that he is less wise compared to our present prime minister or president? But when we live with the uh, prison, prison of the present, when we do not have this multi-temporal hermeneutics, it is easy for us to be slave of the present. And therefore, our thought becomes closed. So moving quickly, I would uh, bring here the issue of archaeology of knowledge that Foucault talks about. Foucault talks about that when we are archaeology, you know, this knowledge, it has a text, we study text, but we also see monuments or documents in, in the archive, we see documents. But these documents also become monuments. So Foucault talks about document and monument. But dear friend, I also want to bring movement to it. So therefore, we need a new archaeology, not only of knowledge, but also life, where we deal with life, with text, you know, monument, and we challenge the monumentalization of life. Our friend Professor Pande is now joining us from Lucknow. I'm sure he has visited the the grand part that respected Maya Bhatiji had, had constructed. Now, those kind of monuments, but yes, it has a place, but what has really done to the emancipation of life and that to our marginalized still Dalit brothers and sisters. Therefore, a new archeology span of life is a questioning of the monumentalization of knowledge, monumentalization of ideology, for example, and opening up for the true liberation of life. So here I quickly come to the theme of the Upanishad of life, as I have suggested, that when we sit together, it becomes an Upanishad. But what is this Upanishad? See, Aurobindo is saying, the Upanishads are epic hymns of self-knowledge and world knowledge and God knowledge. For Sri Aurobindo, the poetic sentences of Upanishads are full of revealing power and suggestive thought color that discover a whole infinite to a finite image. Some of the prose Upanishads offer vivid narrative which can resonate with the anthropological and sociological practice of description but they also offer glimpses of that extraordinary sphere and movement of spiritual inquiry and passion for the highest knowledge which made the Upanishads possible. So here, it is in that sense that how do we make thinking also Upanishad? And very quickly, I would conclude my presentation in five to seven minutes so that we have enough time to also listen to Professor Pandey, Dr. Pyle, all friends present. And here I want to quickly bring the idea of conversation, how thinking is conversation. Now, when we are speaking together, when we are coming from different culture, now our intellectual and living traditions have certain certain priority in a non-exclusionary sense. For example, when we are born with India, we seem to be more open to the intuitive and the spiritual dimension of life in a very open sense. Therefore, when we are talking with our Western philosophers and sociologists, so far, because of colonialism of knowledge, we always feel diffident, apologetic, to talk about the spiritual and the intuitive dimension. 
but conversation means that all of us are equal partners and seekers in the journey of knowledge. So why feel inferior? Why feel apologetic? Because of the burden of colonialism. So it is in that spirit, I do not have time further to elaborate, but here I give the thought of a very creative African philosopher, Jonathan Chima Konam, who has also contributed an essay, you know, and afterward to a volume on roots and routes I have edited. Chima Konam gives the idea of horizontal dimension of conversation and vertical dimension. At the horizontal level, we must realize that each one of us are same and therefore resist all imperialism and colonialism of knowledge. But at the vertical dimension, like from India, with a living tradition of spirituality, when we are talking with our Western philosopher friend, let us not shy away from talking about the spiritual dimension of thinking. Let us not shy away from thinking that thoughts also have sources in the unthought dimension. And once we speak this, it can also correspond to thinkers like Martin Heidegger from the West. So therefore the horizontal and the vertical coming together. And here, I my slide of Iqbal is coming and I'm quoting here Javid Majid who writes about Iqbal. Iqbal's reconstruction, that is the reconstruction of religious thought of Islam emerges from the cosmopolitan zones of global conversation that underpinned Indian intellectual life as a style and way of thinking in the 19th and 20th century. In order to think in different traditions in dialogue with each other, Iqbal detemporalizes history of thought, presenting these thinkers as if they were contemporaries who discussed the same philosophical and metaphysical question. By detemporalizing the history of engagement between Islam and European thought, Iqbal presents the encounter as a conversation among intellectual equals. This method of detemporalizing and creating fields of conversation has important implications for cultivating a creative sociology of conversations or social thought as conversations or philosophy of conversation. So I'm concluding very quickly. And, and therefore, when we converse, when we speak with each other, we cannot just construct our own sociology, like Indian sociology or European sociology. All these sociologies, they have some distinctive character, but how do they interact with each other, going beyond both anthropocentrism and Eurocentrism? And finally, I'm saying that it is in this context that when we speak with each other, when we speak with each other, we many times fail to communicate, but sometimes we are able to communicate across borders and transcend our initial self-centeredness and closure. And that is the spirit of Krishnamurti also, that how do we go beyond egoism? So here, spirituality and sociology has to come together. Such sharing creative spaces and times of hope. And when we share our thoughts together, it creates spaces and times of hope. So thinking thoughts are not working alone. That creates spaces and times of hope. And hope here is ecological and transcend the egoistic limits of both hope and despair. So finally, dear friends, I invite you to join in singing with me these lines of poem, devoted to fire. Maybe Krishnamurti didn't do any fire ceremony, but we can do our own <laughs> little fire, <laughs> as there are many young men and women, and we can sing this song. O fire, purify our soul. Be a thread of communication. Make the horizontal vertical. Vertical and embracing horizontal. Our egos of killing become waters of love. We flow together, O oh fire, towards new source of co-realization. So dear friend, 
thoughts are not walking alone and they are holding our hands and they are inviting us they are challenging us to join this with critic creativity courage and transformation towards new source of co-realization thank you uh, thank you so much sir it was really a very thought provoking yeah. session and uh, you really uh, unearth many sociological insights in, in uh, krishmurthy's thought so thank you so much sir for giving a very uh, creative presentation now i would like to invite uh, professor ajit kumar pandey sir he is from uh, famous banaras hindi university and uh, sir kindly uh, yes some uh, of the line yes 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 Uh, yes over to you sir line. yes thank you very much thank you uh, actually uh, first of all i express my thanks to uh, professor anand giri uh, and uh, your institution uh, uh, i have been invited by uh, uh, by professor anand giri and uh, on I, i believe on the behest of professor anand giri uh, your institution has asked me to deliver i mean to interact with you at this moment of time Uh, uh i listened to professor anand giri uh, around 45 minutes and uh, that has provided a lot of conceptual materials substantive conceptual materials for theory building not only in social sciences but also in humanities where theories are regarded to be functions of social reality so beautifully you could manage to uh, conceptualize the social reality uh, as a matter of fact his basic assumption was that uh, history of uh, sociology or social science is the history of the critique of the positivistic thinking and thought i started from a positivism where the reality is regarded to be uh, empirically grounded via uh, phenomenology hermeneutics he went to post modern uh, concept of reality where he could manage to refer to derrida and many more people who go i don't like to dwell on that because uh, i'm fully satisfied and, and 100% agree with his entire presentations uh, but i like to refer to in between his talks two things number one that uh, so beautifully when he was talking about hermeneutics where uh, the, uh, the the knowledge or the reality whatever you call it is regarded to be experiential form of the common sense thinking or understanding of everyday life interactions is number one i 100% agree with him this moment of time and uh, i also agree with when he was referring to and again with certain kinds of limitations have a massive perspective Where, where the entire problem is, you know, may, may be attributed to two uh, ideas. One is, or uh, two concepts. One is demoralization, another is depolarization. Uh, may, I can't explicate that because of the paucity of time. Uh, there are many more speakers. So uh, instead of speaking uh, uh, in a broader framework, I like to confine my talks uh, within a framework which you call as sociology of knowledge. where i like to answer back uh, many of the uh, problems that uh, professor giri has raised here i like to position thomas uh, many uh, years have passed uh, thomas kuhan thomas kuhan is regarded to be uh, one of the scholars in the areas of sociology of knowledge and philosophy of science uh, this thomas kuhan along with his friend uh, watkins uh, both of them uh, have uh, exchanged uh, various uh, impenetrable views at the national and international colloquiums uh, uh, i like to refer to some of these significant views which have the uh, implications for the present day topic that the thoughts are not walking alone uh, actually uh, uh, kohan is the uh, i understand there are uh, two uh, kohans i am tempted to posit the existence of two kohans thomas kohans uh first kohan is the author of a book 
call the structure of scientific revolutions. And second, uh, Kohan is uh, the author of another book with the same title. It is the uh, other uh, cited uh, repeatedly by uh, Karl Popper, as well as many more professors, uh, philosophers, for instance, Ferebend, uh, Lagatos, uh, Tolinia, and Watkins, uh, that uh, both the books uh, bear the same title. Uh, uh, cannot be all together bear the same title. Uh, uh, cannot bear the same title uh, uh, accidentally uh, for the views they uh, uh, present in the, I mean, the, in these books uh, uh, often overlap and are in many cases expressed in the same works, but their central concerns are usually different. Kohan seems an occasion to make points that subvert essential aspects of the positions that he has been uh, taking. Uh, I'm sorry I can't dwell on this point because of once again the positive time because some of the ideas have been already uh, discussed by my friend Professor Giri. So lacking the wit to extend this fantasy. Uh, I understand that Giri is uh, competent in this uh, uh, expressions. I will instead explain why I have embarked uh, upon this issue. Uh, much in the books, these two books that I have referred to, uh, testifies uh, to what we may describe as the gestalt uh, switch that uh, uh, divides uh, readers of uh, uh, his scientific revolutions into two groups. Uh, together with the thought in this book, uh, uh, other contributions uh, provide, uh, uh, therefore, an extended example of what may be called partial or incomplete communications. Uh, the talking to each other and regularly characterizes uh, discourse between participants in incomparable points of view. Uh, such communication breakdown is important and it's much studied. Uh, unlike uh, <clears throat> Ferebend, I don't believe that it is ever total or beyond uh, records where he uh, talks of incommensurability, uh, tout court. Uh, Kohan uh, uh, has regularly spoken also of partial communication and I believe it can be uh, improved upon to whatever extent circumstances may demand and patience permit. Uh, this is a point deserves to be elaborated, but once again, the paucity of time. But uh, this is a fact universally acknowledged that neither, uh, uh, Kuhan, not, neither does Kuhan believe that the sense in which we are prisoners caught in the framework of our theories, uh, our expectations, our past experiences, our language is made is merely Pickwickian. Nor do uh, I suppose that we can break out of uh, uh, our uh, framework at any time. Into when I speak of our framework, we speak of once again uh, our Indian framework, our traditional framework, drunk upon the ideas of Upanishads and many more great philosophers that uh, Anandgiri has referred at any time into a better one from which we can at any moment break out again. Uh, if that possibility were routinely available, uh, there ought to be uh, no very special difficulties about stepping into someone's framework in order to evaluate it. This is how uh, the history of philosophers and their contributions, if you look into that, uh, the uh, critiques attempt to uh, step into a prevailing thought uh, suggest that uh, changes a framework junk upon some thought, particular thought of theory, of language, or a paradigm pose deeper problems of both principle and practice than the preceding thoughts recognize. These problems are not simply those of ordinary discourse, and uh, neither they will be uh, resolved 
by quite the same techniques. If they could be, or if changes of framework were normal, occurring at will and at any moment, they would not be uh, comparable to the uh, culture class or classes. Uh, here I'm quoting Karl Popper. These are the terminal quote, you know, quotations from Karl Popper, which has or have stimulated some of the greatest intellectual uh, revolutions in our thought structures. The uh, very possibility of that comparison is what makes them so very important. Uh, when you talk of the Indian traditions, actually Indian tradition is uh, locked into uh, uh, four value themes, uh, right from hierarchy to the transcendence. But, uh, Anand Giri has uh, once again very nicely, beautifully uh, spoken to all of us. But uh, I like to tell you the unity of our, you know, the uh, society that we live in, Indian society, is. Uh, embodied into unified principle of consciousness, which, which has been representing the inner structure of our society. This is not the uh, material reality as positivists and many of the thinkers have been talking about, right from positivism to Habermas's uh, deconstructionism, no, sorry, uh, radical uh, constructionism. Uh, it is postmodernist have pointed out but not in a fashion that our tradition is trying to talk of. So what is needed this moment of time that we must focus on the moral values, the reality which is transcendent, which what uh, A.K. Saran has been talking about time and again, it's a transcendent reality. Unless we do have this concept of reality, we cannot have, I do agree with Anand Giri, our sociology in the real sense of terminology. Thank you very much, I will not, uh, bore you for a longer period of time. Thank you very much. I'm uh, uh, sorry if I, my, I continue with my harangues. That will be very boring. I could manage to bring back home some of the uh, significant ideas uh, which uh, have been touched by my friend, Professor Anandgiri, but I sort of, once again, uh, uh, reinforcing these points, particularly in a framework of sociology of knowledge, Karl Popper and Thomas Cohen. Thank you very much once again uh, to uh, all of you, to the uh, organizer, to the convener, and specifically uh, Randi uh, Gautam Sahab and my friend, uh, Professor Anand Girisa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. If you have any Thank question, you, you can ask. Yes. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Thank you, Professor Pandey. And now, Yes, Randir ji, Randir bhai, we'll have Dr. Pius and then we'll have the discussion. Uh, sir, we have uh, one more uh, intellectual here, uh, Dr. J.S. Anand. So uh, after Payal, ma'am, I will invite him uh, to no, give his No, I'm, I'm requesting uh, Dr. Uh, B.T. Pius, who is a discussant. So mm -hmm. please invite Dr. B.T. Pius, Dr. Yes. Pius. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Yes, yes, yes. So, respected chair, Dr. Randir, if I'm uh, spelling your name properly, I couldn't hear it properly. And uh, my dear mentor and friend, Professor Ananda Kumar Giri, and all the distinguished speakers. It was great to listen to Professor Ananda Kumar Giri and his thoughts on, thoughts are not walking alone. Social thought as conversations and a new Upanishad of life and ecology. I've heard Professor Giri many times and every time it was enlightening. Thank you so much personally. Professor Giri was asking us to move from thought to ecology of thought and social dialogue. Perhaps I'm really interested in this dimension, perhaps in my research, in my own humble way, I'm trying to do this. To what extent I could do this, I do not know. Because when he figured it out in a proper language, I feel inspired. So I'll just briefly summarize some of the basic ideas which I got from his text. Social thought as conversation involves new engagement with self, other culture, society, and knowledge. 
conversation bring us near conversations bring us near as we see together and learn together social thought as conversation creates fields and circles of learning and encounters in which we take part as seekers and learners rather than as carriers of a priori hierarchies of knowledge such as eurocentric privileging of knowledge and neglect of knowledge and epistemic and ontological traditions from other parts of the world of course he's quoting from sosa and his own writing social thought as conversation interrogates and transforms hierarchies of knowledge and creates conditions and movements where we all interested seekers and learners take part in conversations as equal and dignified partners this is the horizontal aspect of conversation which is also accompanied by a vertical dimension where a partner of and participants in conversation we are not afraid to bring some of the unique emphasis of our initial cultural philosophical sociological and intellectual traditions to our fields and circles of conversations unquote very inspiring very interesting very deep so i feel that the idea of metaphor of social thought as ecology of thought to the concept of descender or takes us to the concept of descender and deconstructed idea of knowledge and multi angled theorization theorization which informs us different epistemologically border crossing conceptual pairs such as, such as system and life world truth and meaning intercultural and interbeingness etc intercultural and interbeingness it universalizes the non universalizability of all knowledge that is the basic idea what i am thinking there is no universalizable thing that is being universalized everything is contextual and singular because we had to make conversation knowledge negotiated by social thought makes it an ecology of thought where an emancipation and critical consciousness of life and allow an intercultural contextualization perhaps in the old language of habermas of course professor giri will be am so many things to correct me here the ecology of thought as social dialogue is post metaphysical and post traditional though habermas's anchorage is in what we call a crazy western epistemological idea and eurocentricity this is a debatable point the post metaphysical stance in habermas makes a critique of the western metaphysical tradition and its overrated conception of reason by demystifying the metaphysical traps that shapes its concepts of reason i think habermas is still very valid here you know the kind of discussion professor giri was talking about he was quoting habermas many times and he is using habermas in a very creative way rejecting and accepting that is very interesting it's very interesting so the aspects of metaphysical thinking according to habermas presents itself in identity thinking which sustains the sense of mythical wholeness in the concept of reason in pertaining to a strong idealism which glorifies thought as the primordial and persistent act of producing the one and the whole habermas challenges it in a very interesting way so i think even when the post metaphysical self reference restricts and sets an ideal critique situation beyond the scattered local commitments this is the place where habermas comes out with his slightly eurocentric ideas of the various universal discourse the intercultural ideal that habermas thought precipitates that's what i think habermas is precipitating an intercultural idea directs us to head for radical rethinking of thought as we heard from professor giri of course these are debatable and with minute epistemological and theoretical problems however interculturality i i i try to perhaps compare this ecology of thought with interculturality the idea of interculturality however interculturality of ethical and contextual sensitivity to singularity and singularness to the untheorized to the untheorized and the inclusion of the other tells us about an ecology of thought and thought as social dialogue so i think we have many parallels in india and all over the world which challenges the rigidity of self sameness in thought here comes the importance of interculturality and the ecology of thought as professor giri has pointed out arvindo 
Jiddu Krishnamurti, in a very important way, the Upanishads, Gandhi, Toro, Tolstoy, and so on. There are so many names. I would like to mention a few things about our current situation in this context. Perhaps with that, I'll wind up. I'm sorry if I'm taking more time. Do I have five to six, uh, ten minutes more? Okay. Yes. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm reminded of a very interesting uh, movie made by G. Arabindana, a well-known filmmaker, Malayalam. I'm from Kerala. Uh, a movie about Jiddu Krishnamurti. And the title of the movie is The Sage Who Walks Alone. The Sage Who Walks Alone. That was the uh, movie's title. Very interesting. I've seen that movie. Uh, and as Professor Giri has told us, Tagore was telling, Ekla Chalore. Ekla Chalore. Walk alone. But I think their walking alone makes a horizon of co-walking. They're making a horizon of co-walking. Thinking together and thinking alternatively. An ecology of thought. So I think here we have to think about the pandemic because Professor Giri was mentioning about the pandemic, the present situation, et cetera, et cetera. In the context of Jiddu Krishnamurti, I would like to connect it with Krishnamurti because Krishnamurti can tell us so many things here. The pandemic situation, we have to envision the ecology of thought, particularly from the point of view, one of the alternative voices of India as well. Tagore, as well as Jiddu Krishnamurti, both of them. Our COVID anxiety and despondency often make us fall into a frenzy. That is a problem now. Time becomes frozen into a self-centered, endless present, which is one-dimensionally forgetful of the diverse enormity of the different eras of life and civilization. It, also, it is also very sad that we are farther shrunken as human beings. <laughs> pandemic gaze, the pandemic gaze, I would like to call it the pandemic gaze, conditions us, perhaps, and the conditioned unfreedom of yesteryears, as Jiddu Krishnamurti was telling us, the conditioned unfreedom, sediment to make it into a pandemic frenzy. We lose compassion and choiceless awareness. And I think whenever we use the word choiceless awareness, in the language of Habermas, it may be post-metaphysical or anti-metaphysical or post-traditional. Immediately, what comes into our mind is compassion. Compassion. We have so many traditions, the Buddhist traditions, Krishnamurti tradition, Aravindo tradition, there are Gandhi's tradition. There are so many traditions which is talking about compassion. So we forget the unmatched sufferings and misfortunes when we fall into the frenzy of the pandemic, the bygone eras of human life faced, the global, national, and personal mishaps and tragedies, a genius like Tagore, of course, Yudhu Krishnamurti also had to face. They were beyond our imagination. We forget it. World wars, pandemics, fascism, colonial oppressive rule, political deaths, violence, murders, communal violence, spineless countrymen who largely misunderstood both of them personal losses of the dear ones, in his own language, in the language of Tagore, okay. the crisis in civilization. Perhaps all of them inspired Come by what to be more the, and more. Data. Sorry, yes. More and more life affirming, more and more life affirming, more and more mm. compassionate, with a burning faith in the inner goodness and the creative power to self-overcome. All these words come together, I think. They are a kind of network woven together, self-overcoming, meeting the other, inclusion of the other, interculturality, choiceless awareness, social thought, ecology of thought. There are so many thinkers. There are, sorry, sorry there, there are so many thinkers, writers, mystics, and common men of the last century who would invite and challenge us along the Tagore to sell or or Tamurti to overcome and self-transcend to reach out and achieve a new spirit of human creativity. We have to come to a new creative spirituality, as Professor Giri used to tell all the time, a new spirituality, a new spirituality, new vision, new spirituality of the Krishnamurti and Tagorean variety that can bring us back to the compassionate and heroic vision of life affirmation, which is with an elan vital, 
that challenges and regains all that pandemic has taken away from us. Pandemic, I means pandemic is a kind of metaphor, metaphor of, metaphor of conditioned life, unfree life. So I think I'll conclude because Professor Giri was giving wonderful poems, his own and others. So Tagore actually, as a cultural icon of Tagore, still suggests the destiny and trajectory of many themes of thought and contemporary discourses on them. So I just conclude my very brief response to the wonderful presentation of Professor Giri with a small poem of Tagore. Tagore in his Guban Jora Ashankhani, my Bengali is very poor. In that poem, he says, your, your universe encompassing prayer, math, your universe encompassing prayer, math, spread it out in the core of my heart. The night stars, the day sun, all the shades of darkness and light, all your messages that fill the sky, let them find their abode in my heart. Let them find their abode in my heart. May the loot of the universe, may the loot of the universe fill the depths of my soul with all its tunes. May the loot of the universe fill the depths of my soul with all its tunes. All the intensity of grief and joy, the flower's touch, the touch of the flower, the storm's touch, both touch of the flower, touch of the storm. Let your compassionate, auspicious, generous hands bring into the core of my heart. Thank you so much. And I thank specifically Professor Giri for giving me this opportunity to be part of this very interesting evening, thought, co-working, sharing, and what more, I do not know. And I thank uh, the foundation also for uh, you know, picking me up from nowhere. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Thank you so much. It is very, very uh, insightful. And uh, uh, I'm very happy that uh, most of our speaker uh, uh, using the uh, work of uh, Habermas. And the, one of his guiding theme of most of his work related to the conditions for domination-free social interaction. So thank you so much. So, so at this juncture, I thank uh, Professor Pandey so much for bringing many, many deep thoughts to you. And we'll pick up some threads a little later. I also thank my dear friend, Dr. Pius, for really enriching our conversations with so much love and light as Professor Pandey, for example, raising the question of commensurability, incommensurability. So now let us, uh, dear Ranvi, let us have some more thoughts and uh, we can collect questions, answers. Uh, we can collect more thoughts and then after five, 10 minutes, uh, let us have more conversation. So I request uh, participant uh, to ask Yeah, Rani, would you like to ask something? I request a participant to ask. Yes. Yes, Burgis. Okay. Yes. Um, I hope I'm audible. Yes. Yes, Saji. Yes. I am in the remote part of this country of us, so the connectivity is very poor. I can choose between the audio and the video, so I choose audio. While I could two of the speakers, 
who took the opportunity to share this idea process and be thankful to for the opportunity to share my some good friends i'm thankful to professor ananto for sharing once again this thoughts of um, intercultural culturality and border crossing i have heard this very many times this is what professor ananto stands for every time i hear this the beautiful expressions the descriptions today even he made an expression creative unconditional one would uh, be tempted to agree with him and be engaged in the thought process that is the beautiful expression that he makes us engage ourselves into while taking us from krishnamurti to kc batacharya somewhere did you mention kc batacharya professor anand i thought i heard uh, jain mohanti andre baitle while listening to this one would have this somewhere at the corner of the mind this question about fluidity of the self how strong the self ought to be when we talk about inter culturality and interconnectivity i think getting engaged into this contemporary level of thinking whether one would be lost one side entity would be lost into this force of contemporaneity this mode of thinking which is being put into or taking ourselves into i am also tempted to make a reference to mathieu mega school and its theory of shanabangavad self in its momentariness has that uh, stream of consciousness within itself somewhere would it not break would it not be swayed by such contemporary thoughts of interculturality so the question of self and its identity and its fluidity comes into question this is number 1 that i have in my mind somewhere would it be would ourselves be in a danger of getting uprooted or is it that uprootness the need of the hour somewhere we tend to question this me as a keralite me as an indian me as somebody living in northeast imbibing these cultures am i to be get swayed away by these forces of interculturality number 2 is this transformational the concept of transformational transformational harmony professor ananta would always speak of this transformational harmony co-working co-learning mutually going beyond a certain level whether it would require or necessitate a kind of epistemology which is new which would also be equally creative and transitional these are two thoughts uh, two inquiries that i have in my mind i am sure that professor ananta would care to reflect on this and share his ideas on this thank you thank you so much dear sajib very very deep thoughts 
and when i am listening to you i am feeling you are really surpassing yourself <laughs> i am so happy thank you and uh, now let us listen to more thoughts dear randeep i think we have minati who has raised her hand yes yes aminati uh, pradhan yeah yes hello good evening everyone actually i have one i mean not question it is i want anant bhai to put more light on this while speaking he was telling while we speak together we should listen and then speak like no almost like equal amount i just want to know it is the influence of colonialism or pre colonial colonialism also it was existed in indian philosophy where many ancient text says that you should do to gain knowledge you should do listen more and talk less so i just want anant bhai to more light on this thank you thank you minati very deep question any other friends maybe now randeep you can kindly share your thoughts <laughs> uh okay so we are also running out of the time so uh some of uh our participants uh you know asked a very deep question and uh, one of our speaker uh professor pande he engaged uh, uh jadu krist murthy's thought uh with two important thinker karl popper and uh thomas kuhn and uh, in indian tradition i find uh mn roy a very famous uh social scientist and uh, because he was uh, uh delivering his lecture in the context of sociology of knowledge and mn roy also problematized the way thomas kohn problematized social science and uh, what mn roy see mn roy said social science is suffering from the disease of determinism and i found that is a very important and crucial insight that uh, not even a single theory i i have a kind of sympathy with uh, critical theory who said <laughs> who uh, 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 it really tells about uh, uh everything behind the theory why he think in this way the pattern of thinking he underlined but not even a single paradigm except critical theory tells about anything means why they think the way they think right so problematizing the question of thinking uh, is a crucial thing and i found in krishnamurti genesis of thought he problematized the domination in thinking that's why he was against ideology but what thomas kohn say he when he understand paradigm he says paradigm is a kind of ideology and everybody you know in social science think about to have a kind of paradigm and ultimately limits its uh philosophy for that matter so uh, it was really a kind of uh, discussion which i like to have and uh, particularly uh, for uh, so far as the habermas is concerned yes habermas also engaged with uh, uh, a kind of thinking and he visualized uh, that uh, uh, a kind of domination free social interaction uh, 
through his work of communicative action. And even he, uh, you know, uh, one important theme of his uh, thought is uh, pragmatism. Uh, recently, uh, you know, he had this uh, religion for that matter, religion in between naturalism and religion, where he uh, discussed uh, region and tolerance in depth. Uh, one of his best work is in this regard is theory and practice, where he analyzes uh, a kind of uh, the difference between the classical and modern form of political thought and the concept of natural law. So Habermas uh, uh, sociological thinking is very significant uh, when we understand uh, the, uh, the, the project of uh, domination free science or in social science. So this was my observation and I really uh, learned a lot from your uh, conversation. And uh, I have never ever uh, thought like the way projected, you projected um, uh, uh, Professor uh, Amen uh, Srinivas and Andre Vite. Andre Vite, you know, uh, one of his uh, 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 article uh, called ideology and uh, thinking and ideology where he problematized uh, the question of ideology but not in, you know in a theoretical sense uh, he just gave a kind of uh, illustration that uh, ideology has a kind uh, you know ideology uh, has very negative connotation when we uh, understand theory with ideology. So uh, thank you so much, sir. And uh, one of uh, uh, the thinker, uh, very famous thinker of sociology of knowledge, Professor A.K. Saran. And uh, he also problematized the question of uh, domination uh, from the point of view of sociology of knowledge. So it was really a kind of very, uh, very uh, significant, uh, I, I would say the lecture if one uh, uh, tries to understand Chris Murthy and his relevance for uh, sociological thought, then the question of domination definitely comes into the mind. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ranadi. Uh, before I share some thoughts with gratitude to all friends who have really brought the whole jewel of thinking, one feels to and it is really a gift. I see some friends co-present. So if possible, let us quickly listen to them for a few minutes. Um, I see Sushri Appa present. I also see one friend named Sanuja Wagmare in the participant list and uh, Sandhya Appa. So, I invite you to kindly share. You can speak in Odia or translate, and then very quickly we'll sum up by any time. So let us begin with uh, Sanuja, please. Sanuja. Okay, it's not coming. Then let us invite uh, Susri Appa, indeed, and then Sandhya Appa, Indira. Very good evening to everyone. Am I audible? Why I hope so. Yes, yes. Yes, you are. Okay. Okay. First of all, thank you so much for uh, uh, such a wonderful uh, session. Uh, I got uh, uh, said the list. This gave a lot of threads of thoughts, uh, a lot of points to ponder. Uh, many, uh, um, not only in your but also uh, when I was listening to Dr. Pius, when I was listening to uh, Saji, when I was listening to even Dr. Randir. Uh, so no questions because I pretty much agree, pretty much uh, you know, uh, with most of the, uh, rather all the points. There are a lot of things which I would want to further uh, uh, 
you know uh, deliberate upon and uh, think and write uh, very quickly i'll probably just uh, in the interest of time i'll just take one uh, single i mean although there are so many uh, points that i have uh, noted uh, to be thought and written about just one thought i would just quote what you uh, professor giri uh, said in uh, that thinking is uh, conversational uh, but also thinking calls for uh, solitude or rather meditative solitude to quote you as exactly so this uh, brings me to the uh, you know uh, little thought and solitude um, as you know i mean being a poet solitude is one i would say is one of the essential infrastructure uh, for any poet's journey so uh, it is in that sense uh, you know and having said that i mean solitude i always keep separate from loneliness or rather in a sense that it is exactly opposite of loneliness uh, in a way that solitude makes you full solitude whereas or rather solitude is that when we uh, when we carry everyone along so it is in that sense solitude is also conversational and uh, thoughtful uh, in 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 this uh, thought and spirit there's a poem uh, in case time permits i can uh, present else uh, yes, i think the discussion today okay okay thank you uh, no no you can present your uh, poem you have okay. enough time yeah. okay all right so uh, i'll just finish with this few lines of the poem uh, the, the title of the poem is solitude and uh, basically a dialogue with solitude i stood for long on the line of illumination being a bridge between uh, just to give a little anecdote to this is the journey of poetry or the poet together i stood for long on the line of illumination being a bridge between the day and night i have won my tears in bargain with god for arbitration between wrong and right many often my tears often looked unreal <clears throat> my tears often looked unreal since they did not speak of the pain and misery those the world knows many times i sat in silence staring at the starry sky wondering if the world was inverted or it was i my solitude has buried in its script countless questions they outnumber the stars today the dead questions are reborn they surround me with new ardor today once again in the crowd i am alone with a sigh i look up and wonder who collected my tears and questions who soured the answers among the innumerable ones twinkling over there was there a lonesome one too leaving my mind sharing with me the space and time so thank you thank you uh, dr randeep thank you professor uh, giri and thanks everybody and to all thank speakers uh, who spoke i wish i had enough time to actually uh, take quotes from everyone uh, thanks for all the uh, thoughts and knowledge that has been received today thank you appa then randeep and dear friends let us quickly invite uh, sandhya appa and also another brother jagat jyoti bhai very quickly and then i will some of the few minutes sandhya appa okay then jagat jyoti bhai okay maybe is taking some time so so dear friends it has been really enriching evening and being with all of us together beginning with professor pandey many deep set of co thinking reflections and uh, yes uh, for example the whole uh, challenge of commensurability and incommensurability and how do we move 
with incommensurability towards commensurability, which again is not necessarily total but partial. It's a very important challenge to work it together with. And the point is that there is not total, if there is not total commensurability, there is also not total incommensurability. And when we make an effort, then it helps us in our journey of communication and commensurability. And that is where transcendence is that we are transcending from where we are. It is not just a very big thing out there. Even every little element of our breath, when we take a step together, when we yearn something, it helps us. And the focus on the moral is so significant because it is that moral understood in a very broad way, where we are, who we are, and what Pius mentioned about compassion. That compassion is a living aspect of the moral, the living morality. And, um, and that is where you know, transcendence happens. Then Pius, thank you so much. And uh, you have really been so, so deeply, deeply insightful. <laughs> and when I was listening to you, my heart was dancing with joy. The kind of, that kind, that is where philosophy becomes alive. Mm -hmm. and, and that is where philosophy, poetry, filmmaking, and you know, and that is, you know, this is the kind of the philosopher. And I'm sure Krishnamurti would be very happy with that modality of world engagement. Habermas very happy because all of our people that whom we are referring to, they are really lively philosophers and thinkers. And we got a glimpse of that in Pius, for example, in this very, very creative uh, articulation that when we are walking, there is a horizon of co-working. That is so beautiful indeed, so pregnant, because at some point we are working. In the pandemic situation, physically we are staying alone. But that does not necessarily mean that we are away from that reality of co-living and compassion. And the very deep thought is that uh, Engaging with Habermas in this way, that the whole post-metaphysical, then it becomes a critic of the accepted modalities of metaphysics, of reason, of law, and, and the critic of the post-metaphysical, or the critic of the metaphysical and the journey with post-metaphysical becomes a beginning of varieties of opening and therefore interculturality and interbeing. Both the journey of moving across culture and across beings, it requires a critique of the metaphysical understood in this sense. And of course, this inter also has a dimension of trans. Trans understood in both ways. Like, let us say, transcultural. Now intercultural and transcultural. Now intercultural is within the transcultural. But with the transcultural, there is an added cultivation of the trans that yes, we are intercultural. And that is in a way, it also thinks with the very important question that our dear friend Saji also has read. That it, that it is that in intercultural and this whole root that we are rooted, but then all our roots are also part of routes. Therefore, the whole ecology of existence is that even as a person from Kerala, when I'm staying in Shillong, or as a person of Odisha, I stay in Chennai, that this whole ecology of existence it's not necessarily making out away, it is not destroying my roots, you know. And but how do I creatively live an ecology of coexistence with challenges, of course? But these challenges are also inviting.
intercultural, but also trans in terms of trans T R A N C E. That whole wonder, for example, and Tagore is here so significant, the wonder of living. And that wonder, W O N D E R, is accompanied by wonder, W A N D E R. So, how do we become wanderers in thinking? Because to think the unthought, we also have to be nomad, you know, the whole idea of paribrajak. But paribrajak also in a much more, you know, adventurous spirit of Sri Aurobindo talks about not pilgrims. Sri Aurobindo thinks that the idea of the pilgrim is too much rooted to the trodden path. Sri Aurobindo talks about the scout. And he has a poem with the wind and the weather beating around me. Who would come with me? Who would climb with me? And that kind of adventure, courage, and radicality. So that and also joy, because there is a trance here, and you get trance not only by eating a lot of opiums, you know, <laughs> and which is the current way of thinking, you know, to think outside the box. At some point, you know the story how the hippie revolution, they used a lot of ganja and, you know, and unfortunately this has got banned. Even Aldous Huxley, he used some substance. But we have other ways of feeling enchanted and tranced. And then, um, and then Saji, thank you so much for bringing such deep questions. And again, it is such a creative journey with some of these humble thoughts. And yes, this bringing um, Madhyamika philosophy and Kyanamanga Bhada is so important. And it really poses a very deep question. We would have to think uh, further about it, that how the moment and certain kind of a continuity across moment. And even the Buddhist thought, when it talks about the moment, but the Buddhist thought also is not a prisoner of the moment. And therefore, the liberative dimension lies in crafting a kind of continuity, and one can say a non-essential continuity, a non-essentialist continuity. And then um, I think, uh, and this is the question that I, that that is the most important question. And then of course, uh, you know, to think further about new epistemology. I think uh, this is uh, very important. A new epistemology, and this is again a very, very important question. A new way of knowing, a new way of being. We are knowing being and values and cosmology, all these things are coming together. And this new epistemology also becomes a sadhana. How does knowledge come from? If you look at modern knowledge system, the great sociologist Robert Uthno from Princeton University, many years ago, almost 30 years ago, wrote a book called Communities of Discourse. Therefore, it is this new way of knowing also requires experimental community. Because the modern scientific establishment is too much imprisoned within what is acceptable and what is non acceptable. But we come together and new ways of knowing, new ways, for example, poetry. Poetry is also a way of knowing. And can we write poetry also as a way of arguing in philosophy and sociology? Why not? Because philosophers, you look at the famous philosophers. Now, there is an example of a philosopher using his trash can where you put your, uh, you know, sugar, you know, the cigarette that you are, <laughs> and then the leftover cigarette is it is in your cigarette trash, and you are using that example to think philosophically. The great philosopher Martin Heidegger. He thought with the poetry of Holder Lynn. But he himself didn't write poetry as a way of philosophical thinking. So the point is that this new knowledge 
also is challenged to have many more modality of evidence and so on and so forth, representation. In sociology, we are used to tables. Most of the sociological diagram is table. Why not have circles? Have you seen many circles in sociological diagrams? That's the question of art. Why not also have poem that other people have written and, and one has written as an aspect of sociological reasoning? Though the conventional establishment would not allow it, but only when some of us we start doing, that is the work of a creative minority that the great historian Arnold Toynbee spoke about. That the whole crisis of civilization that we are in, it is not now only Toynbee's studies of history tells us that how humanity has gone through this civilizational crisis and the response comes with creative minority. And I think the idea of a creative minority is a very interesting way of bringing Krishnamurti and the challenge of critical sociality together by becoming creative minority. And Minoti's question is very deep. And I thank you for your very, very deep, attentive listening. And yes, you know, when I was talking about colonialism, now the colonial masters, they, they came here to rule and shout. And they didn't listen. And you know, and that is the, we are uh, the, all the killing of our knowledge and life is because the colonials, they shouted at us, you know, they didn't listen. Only some of them, you know, very few of them, those who are called the so-called Orientalists, you know, they had the humility to learn, to talk to people. Some of them made friendship with people like Iswar Chandra Vidyasagar, the great ocean of creative communication. But the majority of colonial encounter was top down and just killing and inferiorizing of what knowledge we have. Now, before the before colonialism, there was a kind of dignity of interaction. For example, if you look at 19th century Bengal, now before for example, if you look at Swami Vivekananda, now when Swami Vivekananda is reading European philosophers, he is not internalizing the inferiority that is posed on the Indians, that European knowledge is higher and Indian knowledge is lower. No. And because he has not internalized colonialism, so he is able to listen to both India and Europe with a great deal of openness. But uh, your question about the pre-colonial time is that in the pre-colonial time, as you are saying, the idea was that we ha one has to listen more. And yes, like you know, all, all our traditions of thinking, Upanishads, we listen. But also that has also another dangerous connotation. And sometimes and many times it has been abused that you listen but you cannot argue. And especially for our women, you know, for our brother, mothers and sisters, you know, and that has created the whole, you know, in, the, in this whole, you know, pointing to listening, many times argumentation has been killed. And, and especially in medieval India, Though Amartya Sen in his book, The Argumentative Indian, he says that how we have a rich argumentative tradition. But my hunch is that rich argumentative tradition got killed after some time. And the people who are low caste people and people who are women, they were only made to listen. And they were not allowed to ask questions. And those who asked questions, their tongue was cut up. Now, we must not interpret listening in this sense of healing, the necessity and courage of argumentation. And uh, 
I think um, Susli Opa, let me see your thoughts. Yes, your poem was very, very beautiful. And Randir, yes. And you are bringing together all these elements and the core is a kind of domination-free communication. And this domination-free communication is part of a domination-free society, which Habermas is talking about. But this domination-free state is a journey. It's a process. So therefore, how do we move from domination to non-domination? From hingsa to ahinsa. And in the process, there is an element of domination, but how do we interrogate it creatively and critically challenge it and move from domination to non-domination as a continuous process? So that is the challenge before us. And this realization of non-domination is a multidimensional sadhana and struggle. It has a political dimension, political struggle. It has a spiritual dimension. It also implies who we are. For example, the quality of our desire. The whole, all the challenges, how do we also transform ourselves? Habermas is sensitive to that. The challenge for appropriate self-development, what he calls as post-conventional self-development. And that post-conventional self-development is also the spiritual transformation of ego towards mutuality. So with some of these connecting thoughts, so yes. I thank all dear friends for uh, your very deep and generous co-thinking and co-being. Thank you so much, sir. Now, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Devendra, sir, to give a vote of thanks. Sir? Yes. Uh, sir? Can I have sir, a uh, Sir? Yes. Participate, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Do you have Okay, okay. Questions? Yes, Arun. Ha, sir, Arjun, sir. Ha, ha, Arjun. So, mm -hmm. you want to ask something? Ah, sir, good information. But can I have your okay. e certificates of attendance, sir? This yes, yes. Yes, yes, I will send you. Uh, just uh, in the water. Uh, some no voice is speaking, sir. Email ID. I have your email ID. You will get your certificate. Oh, okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, Devendra, sir. Okay, sir. Devendra, sir. You can give uh, a word. Okay. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. You are audible. Okay. So, thank you, sir. Uh, can I uh, uh, present my insights in one minute and after that I'll uh, go ahead for the present, uh, presenting my word of thanks. Okay, okay. So, uh, I'm Dr. Devendra Tiwari, and uh, really uh, today's uh, discussion and presentation by all eminent speaker was commendable. And uh, actually, uh, sociological terms are a little like Latin and Greek for me, but I was trying to connect it as per my understanding, and particularly the very tight uh, of the dialogue, thoughts are not walking alone. And I would like to, uh, actually, uh, after getting that title, I was thinking uh, to read that title with literature. And for that, I would request uh, one minute uh, extra. So uh, there is a play from Shakespeare, and in that play, uh, uh, entitled Macbeth. In Macbeth, the play begins with an, encourage, in, an encouragement by three witches to the protagonist of the play Macbeth. And the encouragement is kind of thought. And how thought 
taunt into action has been depicted very beautifully by william shakespeare macbeth being a very generous very dutiful devoted dedicated uh, chief of scotland when he is encouraged or invoked by three which is that macbeth you will be king of scotland and there was a friend of macbeth also accompanying him when that hunt was on he uh, the same guy, uh, group of which is said banco you will be the king how that single statement in form of a thought torn the mindset of h mindset of macbeth and macbeth committed so many heinous crime first of all murdering the sitting king of scotland king duncan then uh, as he was knowing that my uh, the prophecy in form of making me king i have fulfilled then definitely the prophecy second prophecy will be ful- fulfilled in form of becoming a king the son of my friend banco the king of scotland so definitely i have to uh, be out of the so he also plans and to kill friend banco he was well surrounded by his uh, enemies and he feels now he his defeat is near so he says if is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing so definitely uh, thoughts are not walking alone every lead to an action and if that action is positive that uh, creates that enhances name and fame of a person who uh, takes action on the basis of certain thought and if that that thought lead to a negative action that becomes the source of downfall of any person so this has been my understanding and thanks for asking me and giving me this opportunity now uh, as i have been asked by the convener of this event, event. Uh, mr ranjit gautam sir for uh, uh, extending my vote of thanks so namaste the present chair i am dr devendra k tiwari assistant professor of english at raffles university nimrana it is my honor and privilege to extend a vote of thanks on this august moment and i would like to thanks mr randeer gautam head of school of humanities and social sciences raffles university the convener of the webinar for giving me this opportunity to extend my vote of thanks on behalf of school of humanities and social sciences raffles university nimrana rajasthan india raise global foundation usa and vishwanidham center for asian blueming i remain deep in debt to professor anand kumar giri uh, for his wonderful deliberation on thought of not walking alone critique creativity and transformation uh, really, uh, sir uh, your today the session was full of information and full of engagement really uh, we shall inculcate the ideas pondered by you in our uh, research i am happy to mention my obligation to dr ajit kumar patel for his wonderful and thought provoking speech i bow my head in gratitude to dr uh, we we team head department of philosophy assam university silchar for this rocking presentation i am grateful to chief patron of raffles university professor justice meena gomber for being the source of inspiration and motivation for organizing such kind of activities i take this opportunity to extend my vote of thanks to divika the ceo of raise global foundation usa for being source of inspiration and encouragement i would like to express my sincere thanks to professor devakar gupti honorable vice chancellor of raffles university i offer my sincere thanks to active participants guests audience and everybody who contributed in making this program materialize last but not least i would like to thank the convener mr randeer gautam for initiation and execution of such a wonderful dialogue finally thanks a lot to lot once again to everybody and i wish you all the time thank you namaste uh thank you so much dr devendra actually he is in uh, his hometown that is why he is facing network problems uh, 
<laughs> and there is a digital divide in india no problem sir thank you so much for your uh, corporate cooperation so uh, it's time to say bye goodbye thank you so much sir anand giri sir uh, pius b thomas sir and uh, professor pandey sir thanks for great deliberation thank you so much